It's my pleasure to welcome you all uh, this evening. This is an absolutely full house uh, this evening for this Edinburgh lecture. This is one of a series of Edinburgh lectures which are being held this summer. And uh, when you came in, you were probably given one of these little booklets which tells you what you, uh, enables you to tell us and the Edinburgh Lecture Organisation what you thought of this particular lecture and others if you want. So please do that. Um, this evening, we have the pleasure of learning about um, John Ray, um, the title being The Forgotten Hero of Arctic Exploration, and of welcoming the guest speaker this evening, Ken McGugan, who is an award-winning author, particularly on this topic and related topics, as you will hear in the lecture, and his wife, Sheena. And um, the vote of thanks is going to be given uh, by Ted Cowan, who's a professor at the University of Glasgow. This is going to be a unique, fascinating story, I can assure you of that. And um, again, just to welcome Ken, um, and please come and give us your lecture. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, John, for that very kind introduction. I want to thank, uh, thank everybody for, uh, for coming out. It's great to see uh, uh, so many people here uh, interested in this topic. Special thanks to uh, Margaret Street, who uh, was uh, instrumental in, uh, in, in getting me here. She's a, a force of nature, uh, as you probably know. Thank you very much for, uh, for doing that. And what a, what a thrill it is to be here. I love this, uh, this setup. I mean, given the, uh, the hall adjacent and so forth, the overflow, it's really quite fantastic. Uh, so I'm, I'm really very thrilled to be here. Um, I am going to talk, as you can see, about <clears throat> John Ray, Forgotten Hero of Arctic Exploration. And uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll see what I've got here. 1813 was the year that uh, Ray was born. And the reason, um, the reason I, I'm, I'm so excited about, about Ray, and I have been for some years now, he, he solved the two great mysteries of 19th century Arctic exploration. He was the one individual who accomplished that. What are those mysteries? Number one, he discovered the final link in the Northwest Passage. And number two, he discovered the fate of the Franklin Expedition of 1845. Um, <clears throat> that's the, um, that was the last uh, Franklin Expedition. So those were the two enduring mysteries when Ray was working in the mid-19th century. And again, he was the one who solved the two of them. Well, before I go on, here we have two images of Ray. <clears throat> You see Ray, the, uh, the Scottish gentleman, if you will, and um, Ray in, in the garb of, uh, of various native peoples uh, who live in, you know, lived in Canada, that's what they were wearing. And people have said, well, that's rather an odd picture. He's got uh, a Cree leggings and uh, Inuit uh, foot gear and uh, different headband from the Ojibwe, etc. And Ray did that deliberately. He was articulating visually his sense of uh, identity, uh, of affinity with the native peoples. This was one of the great distinguishing features of Ray, one of the things that set him apart from so many others uh, who, uh, who explored uh, the, uh, the north of what is now Canada. This is the Stromness Orkney. The Hall of Clestrin, that picture is actually one I shot myself in 1998, the first time I went there. The house has been stabilized now. It was once, uh, you know, a very nice place. His father was a, a, a factor uh, who governed the estate um, and, um, and also worked uh, as a manager for the Hudson's Bay Company in Orkney. You see, Stromness Orkney was the last port of call before sailors crossed the ocean. Uh, if, if they were going to Canada, they, they, they would 
the last place they could get fresh water was in Stromness, Orkney, and you can still see the well where they, they got the water. <clears throat> so they would go to, you know, all the, all, all the whalers would travel north to Orkney, get their, their water, and then cross the ocean to Greenland, to a place they, they called Disco Bay at that time. And that's where they could again call in and, and get fresh water again. But that was the voyage they had to make without fresh water. So it was, that was the reason they would call in at Stromness. And the Hudson's Bay Company <clears throat> was running all its ships through, through uh, Stromness over and they'd sail in and, and into Hudson Bay and that's how they did their business. Um, so Ray's father, this was the uh, trading, uh, this was the H Hudson's Bay Company Center where uh, the ships would, would call in and uh, uh, you know, collect goods to take over. And this was also how, how it happened, how it came about that so many Orcadians worked for the, uh, for the Hudson's Bay Company. First of all, they were here and they were hardy, they were tough, they were disciplined, and they made up the vast majority of the Hudson's Bay Company workers for a great many uh, decades. Um, John Ray, uh, he grew up there in Orkney, um, and he was a natural outdoorsman. He uh, learned to hunt and fish and sail, but he also trained as a doctor. He trained here in Edinburgh at the medical school uh, from 1829 to 1833, um, and he, um, when he was 19 years old, he says, well, I'm going to take a summer job. And he gets on, um, on a ship, Hudson's Bay Company ship, and sails as a, as, as, a, as a ship's doctor. He sails to, with the Hudson's Bay Company down into Hudson Bay, and um, the ship gets trapped in there. The, uh, the ship left late and tried to get out, but... Hudson Strait blocked up with ice and the ship couldn't get out. So it turned around and wintered over in a place right down at the bottom of the bay called Charlton Island. And Ray did extraordinary things. I mean, they were living in miserable conditions because there, weren't, uh, uh, there wasn't enough space at Moose Factory, which is the, um, the Hudson's Bay Company trading post, down in the south, some people had to stay on Charlton Island, living on the ship and in very rugged conditions indeed uh, during a northern winter. <clears throat> and um, Ray found that uh, he was very useful. He, he was not only a doctor, he was very handy and he, he showed a tremendous affinity for this kind of, uh, kind of life. This is here, here, here is where you get to see, you get the feeling. I, I love some of these old sketches, these illustrations that appeared, many of them in the London Illustrated News. You get the sense of sailing through these icebergs, in particular, in, in, and they are amazingly big. <laughs> I've been up there uh, in the Arctic seven or eight times. Uh, one of my colleagues tonight here, Ted Cowan, has, has done the same sailing up in there, and uh, let's see, yes, here's, here's where you get a contemporary scale. So you see, and these are not even the biggest ones, but <clears throat> you get to see how big those things really are, and this is in a very calm sea. It's not always like that, and well, you tend not to go out in the zodiac if it's, <laughs> if it's raging. Whereas in those little wooden ships of the, uh, of the 19th century, it would be quite an experience to sail through the, the icebergs. This is a, an image of Moose Factory in Hudson Bay. Uh, this is more or less as it looked when, uh, when John Ray uh, turned up there. And what happened was, do I have that? No, not yet. <clears throat> What, after that first winter, the chief factor, the man who was running uh, 
Moose Factory for the Hudson's Bay Company, realized this John Ray is an extraordinary character. He is a doctor, which is a, someone extremely useful in these parts, but he's also an incredible outdoorsman. Look at all the things he can do. So he said, you know, why don't you stay over? He'd actually already recognized him during the preceding autumn. And Ray said, no, no, I promised my mother I'd get back. And um, I'm not, you know, going to do that. Well, after the winter, Ray said, you know what? This is pretty fantastic here. And I really am well suited for, for what was his expression, the wild sort of life offered by the Hudson's Bay Company service. And so Ray said, yeah, he let the ship go and he signed on. He said initially it was interesting. <clears throat> well, I'm signing on just to be the doctor though. I'm not gonna do all these other things. <laughs> ship sails away and of course he can't stop himself. He's just a bundle of energy, this guy. And uh, he's doing everything. He uh, very quickly uh, becomes recognized as an extraordinary individual. And what I mean by that, I'll give you an example. Um, he, would, he would help the natives uh, as a doctor as well. And he hears about this accident that's over 100 miles away. He gets on his snowshoes and he heads out across the tundra and he treats the man there who's injured himself with an ax. Then he turns around and in two days, he makes the return journey, 105 miles on snowshoes in two days. He had a couple of guys who started off with him. Nobody could keep up with John Ray, uh, really. I mean, he was, he, was, he was like a superhuman figure. <laughs> um, some of his feats of endurance. And he, of course, he took incredible pride in this as well. And he had a sense of humor about it. But um, they call, his colleagues called him, um, he wasn't the greatest snowshoe walker of the Hudson's Bay Company. His contemporaries referred to him as the greatest snowshoe walker of the age. That's how they thought of John Ray. Um, and again, he learned from the native peoples. He was a good hunter when he got there because of his boyhood in Orkney. And he was hunting at home, bringing home the, uh, bringing home the, the fowl for, for, the, for the table. But he didn't arrive and say, look, I'm, I'm a fantastic hunter. Here's how it's going to be. He did just the opposite. He talked to the native peoples and said, I've never hunted caribou. How do you hunt caribou? I don't know how to cache meat to protect it from the wolves. How do you do that? And his best friend was a, was a, a Cree hunter named uh, Rivers. And um, they would go hunting together, and he learned tremendously from, from his friend Rivers. And he continually learned from the native peoples. He had that kind of respect. He had a certain egalitarian attitude that um, some explorers uh, didn't have. There's the quote about the wild sort of life to be found in the HBC service. You know, I have, I, I, I'm 95% convinced that Ray did have uh, a native wife. Uh, while he, because he served for a number of years here at Moose Factory. And um, there were also a great number of artifacts that were obviously stitched lovingly. Um, with uh, the thistle, the Scottish thistle and so forth, that would have to be done probably in pretty close collaboration. But Ray never, uh, he, he, he kept that quiet. And if you go through the, uh, the files, as, as I did extensively when I was writing uh, Fatal Passage, I mean, I ransacked, the, all his papers are at Cambridge. <clears throat> There's only the slightest illusion in his papers, uh, the, uh, uh, but otherwise it, it was kept very quiet. But there's no question in my mind that he had a native wife through these years, and that was that was that was very important to him. Um, now, what happened was 
George Simpson, who was another Scot, a different kind of Scot, but he was running the Hudson's Bay Company. He was a little, little emperor kind of guy. And um, he would come traveling around to all the various uh, Hud uh, Hudson's Bay Company posts. And so he's running the whole show. When he arrives at Moose Factory, Ray tells him, you know, he, he travels in this canoe, Simpson does, with, a, with a, a bunch of native paddlers. And he's in his top hat, and he's got his own bagpipe player. So whenever he's going to arrive, he announces his arrival. He's got the bagpipes blowing, and he's sitting at the back, and the native the Iroquois paddlers are, and they're the, they're the best paddlers you could find in a big canoe. <clears throat> And Ray says, you know, they're talking after, Ray says, you know, I think that an Orkney boat, you know, rowed by a dozen men could actually outrace your canoe. And Simpson says, what, are you kidding? <laughs> so they make a bet. And Simpson comes back the next year. And Ray, by then, has built a boat. Oh, this is another one of his talents. He's, he's, he's a boat builder. And... He's built a boat with, with, with some men. I mean, he's directed them, he's designed it, he's told them what to do. And then he's trained them. He's trained them as well. So, Simpson arrives this time, and uh, they set out, okay, you've got to go up this, uh, this side of the river, there's an island up there. You go around that island and come back. It's, it's a long, you know, a long haul to give it a good test. Well, of course, <laughs> the paddlers... The paddlers are great paddlers, but they're driving this canoe. The Orkney boat is being rowed. Anyway, the Orkney boat emerges around and, you know, wins handily. So that at that point, Simpson's becoming aware, okay, everything they're saying about this guy, John Ray, is true. He is extraordinary. And at this point, the Hudson's Bay Company has also been searching for the Northwest Passage. This is the quest that's uh, being driven to some extent by the Royal Navy, uh, it's, it, and it's <clears throat> been, it, it, you know, it dates back several hundred years at this point. The Hudson's Bay Company, part of their charter as well, is to do some exploration up there. So they've been sending guys out, and Ray says, look, what if you send me up, uh, what if I go, I lead an expedition up the coast in two small boats, the kind of thing that hasn't been done before. See, the Navy's sending in these relatively big wooden ships with <clears throat> bringing in all their supplies. Ray says, no, we don't have to do it that way. Give me a dozen men and two small boats, and I'll go up the coast, and we'll winter over above the Arctic Circle, which has never been done before. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Simpson says, all right, we'll let this happen. And that is exactly what Ray contrives, manages to do. First of all, he, he makes a, an extraordinary canoe trip from the west uh, down to Toronto to uh, study navigation. There's, a, there's an observatory there. Uh, he studies nat navigation <clears throat> with one of the leading people of the time. So he's, he's got all the tools and techniques, and he didn't have that, so he acquired that. And then he goes back. He goes back, and then he sets out and he, he, may, he undertakes this extraordinary expedition. It's not as extraordinary as some of his later ones, but he goes up to Repulse Bay, winters over. Oh, and Ray was also the main hunter of every expedition he ever led. Again, you, he was unique in that respect. Even other explorers who subsequently went along and lived off the land, they had a party with them. They would have one or two hunters who would handle that part of the thing. Ray was the number one hunter of his expedition. So here, this is from a painting by a guy named Charles Comfort, artist named Comfort, showing John Ray. And you get the landscape right away. This is the first thing that strikes any visitor to the Arctic. Well, wait a minute, there are no trees. It's, it, it, it's, it's purely elemental. You've got sky, you've got rock, and you've got water. And that's essentially what you're looking at. So Ray went up there and he wintered over. It was during this period, now you're up above the Arctic Circle, he's got some Inuit with him. That's their native land up there. And he learns travel and survival skills from, from the Inuit. He doesn't arrive saying, okay, here's how we're going to do it. No, he says, whoa, 
why are you traveling so much faster than I am on your, on your sledge runners? Why, why, and why, on your sledges? And, he, and they say, well, we're icing the sledges. Here's how we're doing it. And oh, okay, he learns that. He learns how to travel to build igloos as you go along. So you're not carrying tremendous amounts of gear. You're, you're living off the land. <clears throat> okay, after he does this expedition, lives o winters over, comes back down. Some people thought he wasn't going to ever return, but whoa, there he is again. And he's early enough that he, he, he was ahead of schedule, so he got on a ship and came back uh, to England. To actually, well, London is where the um, Hudson's Bay Company had its headquarters. So, in Fenchurch Street, I went looking, but I should have known that the HBC, I mean, this has all changed. So it's not there anymore. But, and he publishes a, an excerpt, a, a, the story of his latest expedition in the, in, in the Times. And, okay, at this time, now we're talking 1847, and, and everyone is deeply concerned. That's the question. That's the first mystery that's on everybody's mind. What has happened to Sir John Franklin? Franklin sailed in 1845 in these two state-of-the-art ships. They had libraries. They had music. Uh, he was supposed to appear on the West Coast trailing clouds of glory. Where's Franklin? Nobody's heard from him. He's not He's in the Arctic there somewhere. We know he went in, but he's gone. So they're starting to get worried, seriously worried after two years. Um, now it's starting to get a little long, right? Three years uh, coming up. He's not here. So they, th this is a, an, an artist's rendition of the Arctic Council, which is a subset of the of the of the Royal Navy. And I, I've actually been in this room. If you've seen that movie based on my book, you, you, you'll have seen this room too. Um, here we have, um, let's see, that's James Clark Ross. There's, there's the portrait of Franklin. Uh, this is uh, Sir Francis Beaufort. He's the naval hydrographer or the map maker of the time. This is John Richardson, another Scott. <clears throat> uh, these, are the, these are some of the key figures who are saying, well, what's happened to Franklin? And they actually, Richardson actually went on an expedition with Franklin before. So he's been over. And uh, he, he's mainly a naturalist, though. He's a scientist and a, and a medical man, and he's in charge of, of the hospital, the Royal Navy Hospital down in uh, Portsmouth at this point. And he's getting on now. Uh, you know, he's into his 60s. Franklin was 59 when he sailed, you know, so it's pretty tough up there in the Arctic. Anyway, they've appointed Richardson to go overland because he's done it before. We're going to send James Clark Ross in this way. We're going to send Richardson overland, and we're going to find Franklin once and for all. Um, Richardson, he's been there, and he knows it's kind of tough, so he's really concerned, and he wants a really effective second-in-command. <laughs> who can really do it. And he reads this uh, article in, in the Times about John Ray, and he jumps up and he cries out to his wife, I found my man if I can get him. A lot of people have been sending Richardson applications. I, I want to do it. I can do it. Richardson realizes, oh, this is the real thing. Now, that brings us to the second mystery, uh, the final link in the Northwest Passage, which is why Franklin sailed out in the first place. So you can see here, this is what, when well you see the black, that's unknown when Franklin sailed. They do know this from various voyages, notably by Edward Parry, all the way over to here. Uh, so this is kind of the North Channel. And the Hudson Bay Company, and then Franklin to some extent, has mapped, has charted this coastal area. So. And we know, and they know, they've established that this water along the coast gives you an egress to the Pacific Ocean, eventually. So you can get to the Pacific along here, you can get from the Atlantic in here. So 
all you really need to do when Franklin sails is find this channel, north-south channel, that links uh, these two waterways and uh, you're, you're good to go. Well, also take a note here. King William Land. You see how it's joined here? It's joined with dotted lines on this map, Boothia Peninsula, okay? So it's joined. They aren't quite sure what's going on in this area. They haven't got that figured out yet, but they think this is how it is. And um, so that, that's where it is. I'm going to come back to another map in a couple of minutes. This is an actual drawing up top here by, by John Ray. He wasn't a great artist, okay? Some of them were really, really terrific artists that went out there. George Back, uh, for example, um, and even Samuel Hearn, who, who uh, had been out. He was a, a pretty good artist, but at least we get the sense when Ray goes out, Ray goes out as nominally the second in command to Richardson, <clears throat> who's another Scot from Dumfries, actually. Um, and after one winter, which they spend here at Fort Confidence, uh, they kind of agree, well, Richardson, he, you know, he's, maybe he should go back and give a progress report, and Ray's going to carry on with the other men and, uh, you know, complete the area of the search. So Richardson goes back, and Ray, Ray carries on. Um, and this is, well, just before I get to the 1854, just to, just to give you, I want to give you this sense, uh, that sense of, that, that captures it when you're on the ice and, uh, you know, the sledge is falling through the, uh, through the ice, etc. The, these were the kinds of things that, uh, that happened. Um, <clears throat> okay, 1854. So this is nine years after that preceding map. So what happens? They send out you know, expeditionary fleet after expeditionary voyage, one after the other. And they do manage to open up the map considerably. Remember, they just had this in here. And what, what happened was that Franklin sailed down here. And I followed the, this path, and, and uh, Ted Cowan ha has as well. Um, Franklin came down here. And you remember I showed you King William Land was joined? Okay. That, that had resulted from a mistake that was made. In fact, it's not joined. But Franklin didn't know that. He came down and got trapped in the ice here. You see, the ice was barreling down here. We're talking, you know, ice up to the wall, up to the ceiling here. A wall of ice coming down that channel. And that's, you're not going to be pounding a ship through there. Franklin gets trapped in the ice. This is where Franklin gets trapped in the ice, and this is from where the tragedy unfolds. But I'll just tell you very briefly, before we get to that, um, Ray's 1851 expedition. It, he didn't discover as much as on the 1854, but as a, as a master work of exploration, it, it, it is virtually uh, unmatched. He managed to... Um, so here's Victoria Land, right? Ray came up. Um, he was, he was uh, uh, camped out, overwintered down here. He came up and, okay, they, they got to say here. And he leaves his second in command. He says, okay, we're going we're gonna to build these boats and we're gonna, you're going to bring them down the river as soon as the ice melts, as soon as you can get down the river. I am going, first of all, while the ice is over here, across D Strait, and he, I'm going to go over, I'm going to walk across the ice, and I'm going to explore all over here. He's looking for Franklin. Nobody knows where Franklin is. And he charges all over here. <clears throat> all, he, maps, he maps the coast of Victoria Island. Not the whole island, but a, a good part of it, up to about here. Then he comes all the way back. He's orchestrated this. He manages to get back across the water. Just, you know, it's May, it's starting to melt. He gets back across the water. His right-hand man, another Scot, has brought the ships down to the water. 
Ray takes charge of those two small boats, and he goes this way. Now, just as the melt happens, he goes this way around Victoria Island, all the way up to about here. So he is the one who actually charted all this part of Victoria Island. <clears throat> but, and and he, he, he actually found a, a remnant of the Franklin expedition, of the, a piece of the ship. He went back to London, brought that back. He wasn't, you know, jumping to conclusions. He said, here's part of the ship. <clears throat> uh, or he said, here's, here's something I found. And, you know, you can decide what it is. 1854, he's back. He's back in the Arctic. He's, he's exploring now for the Hudson's Bay Company. And <clears throat> he comes up here, comes up to about here, to a place called Point de la Guiche. And he's an ice expert by now. He's lived a couple of decades in the north and in the Arctic. And he looks at this. It's, it's ice now. But he says, okay, that's young ice. And in the summertime, that is a way through. He realizes that the chart was wrong and that someone could sail through here and then make their way out. So that's the first uh, discovery that he makes. He realizes here, it's subsequently called Ray Strait, that this is open. Okay, on that same expedition, while he's out there charging around, He's, there's Inuit hunters, they, and they're traveling in small parties because they're living off the land. So you can't have 100 people all in one place. The hunters have to go out and get the caribou and bring them back to reasonable sized settlement. And he sees some hunters out there, and they stop and talk. And he says, that's an interesting cap band you've got there. Where did you get that? And the hunter says, well... There was a, a ship, you know, that went, you know, some distance away, and uh, some men died there, and you know, this is where that cap band came from. And Ray says, "Uh huh." So he finishes. Just he he travels north to finish that exploration I'm talking about. Then he comes back and he and he says to to the uh, hunter, "Well, if you've got any other uh, relics, bring them to me." And so he meets up with some more people, and yes, they've got more. Okay, but now, and, and, and some people have a hard time, have had a hard time understanding this. They didn't want to understand it. The ice is melting. Okay, now we're getting into late May. And, okay, Ray knows from the description that the last survivors are probably over there, beyond on, on that other side of the island, but that's an island, and if he goes over the ice, the water is going to melt. And he's not going to be able to get back. He's going to be stuck over there for an entire winter. Um, so he says, okay, tell everyone else to bring the relics to me at my camp further on. And he goes back there, and he settles in with his interpreter, the finest interpreter in the north, William Oligbuck. And he collects all kinds of relics. And it's there, okay, he realizes, okay, this is really definitive. Um, these are artifacts from the Franklin expedition. He recognizes that. Of course, there's no way, now, now, we, now we're talking water. And there's no way he can, he can travel over there. I mean, there's, a, there's land between where he is with his boats and where he's got to go. So he decides to bring, to bring, he ascertains the fate of Franklin. And by the fate of Franklin, quote unquote, okay, the fate of Franklin has to include what happened to the final survivors of the Franklin expedition. Sometimes they, they talk about the fate of Franklin and the discoverer of the fate of Franklin and forget what happened at the end. Well, that was the fate. It was that that Ray brought back and said, look, Here's what happened. And in fact, OK, there's a whole long story. <laughs> and I, I, I ended up telling, writing a whole other book to explain what happened. I, I touch on it in Fatal Passage. But to explain what happened back in England, Jane Franklin was an extraordinary individual. Let there be no question about that. Um, 
But she was extraordinary enough, she was deeply offended at this news that um, the Franklin, uh, the final survivors, had resorted to cannibalism. And um, she blamed Ray for that. Anyway, she was extraordinary enough that she was able to enlist the aid of Charles Dickens, surely the most uh, influential English language writer of the 19th century. He was bringing out household words at this point. <clears throat> so she enlisted his aid to repudiate Ray. Think about that. Somebody like Charles Dickens is on your case, uh, trying to um, refute what you've brought home. But the fact of the matter is, Ray would be vindicated. You see, Lady Franklin and Dickens managed to discredit Ray and his Inuit informants sufficiently that he is the only extraordinary explorer of that age never to receive a knighthood. I mean, Sir John Richardson, Sir James Clark Ross, Sir John Ross, Sir John Franklin, Sir Leopold McClintock, uh, Sir George Back, they were giving them away, like, I don't know, popcorn or something. <laughs> but there was none for Ray, who was the most extraordinary explorer of them all. Um, okay, after the, after the debacle, became, uh, the Franklin debacle became uh, better known. And um, that kind of put the, uh, put the kibosh on northern exploration for a while. Uh, people weren't so keen for a couple of decades there. But the Norwegians, <laughs> those Vikings were pretty tough. I've got a little Viking, a Scottish Viking in me, so I, I feel that. Anyway, Roel Amundsen is the guy who comes out and vindicates Ray 50 years after, uh, after Ray has made his discovery because Amundsen becomes the first to sail through the Northwest Passage. How does he do it? He follows the channel that Ray pointed out. And, and he names it Ray Strait. Okay, he's saying, John Ray discovered this, I've now sailed through it. <clears throat> so, back to Orkney. This is actually, okay, this is the house John Ray was born in. This is a more recent uh, photo uh, of it. You can see it's, it, it, the people are, are, are trying to, um, it's, it's into a holding pattern. People have been trying to save it. And uh, one initiative after another. <clears throat> it ha I mean, to save and restore it. Uh, but it's more or less like this now. And um, in Kirkwall, there's a, another house, Burstain House, uh, that he rented. He married a, a Canadian girl and a Canadian woman, and brought her back, first of all, to Orkney. I believe they meant to start a family uh, and live in Orkney in, in, in the town of Kirkwall there. They lived in this house. It's, this is a very nice house. It's now a, a, a burgeoning uh, bed and breakfast. So that's where Sheena and I stayed uh, three or four years ago <clears throat> when we were last there looking out. It's quite, quite a nice estate, but Ray was renting that. And then, when no family arrived, he and his wife moved to London, to a house in, in Kensington, a very nice place. I was just talking with, with the Margaret Street about it. Uh, Margaret's the one who managed to get a plaque placed on that house, which, I, which excited me, because when I was doing my research, this is, this is the kind of thing I do. This is what I find exciting. I, I went down to the house, because I knew I had the address and figured out where, where Ray lived, but there was no plaque there, so I just said, okay, well, this is the place it looks like, only I'm not sure if it was this house or built before, <clears throat> so I left it at that. But Margaret went ahead and got a plaque put there, which was terrific. So I'm just filling you in a little more on the background here, and, and this is Johaven on King William Island. This is where Amundsen went, this is, this is a contemporary view of it, 
But this is where Amundsen wintered over in his vessel, the Joe. And that's how Johaven got its name. There was no Inuit settlement there when Amundsen arrived in 1904. <clears throat> it was just a harbor, a one among many. Amundsen put his vessel in there, and then, you know, the Inuit found him. They're out hunting on the land all the time. And, um, and they built up a settlement because the ship was there. And uh, <laughs> so it became Johaven, which is a really uh, nice little uh, Inuit settlement there now. <clears throat> So in 1999, I knew that Ray wrote, I, he built a cairn up there in 1854 at the end of his uh, 1854 expedition, overlooking Ray Strait. And he gave us the coordinates in his papers. <clears throat> and I said, you know what? I want to go see if I can find that cairn. And again, this is the kind of crazy thing that happens. I thought someone might be trying to race me up there. <laughs> I don't know why, but I was worried that someone was going to get to that cairn first. But that didn't happen. <clears throat> anyway, so I went up with one other guy from Calgary, where I was, I was living then. Flew up to Edmonton, had to overnight there, and then to Yellowknife and then another plane to Johaven, and then Louis Kamukak, who is a, an Inuit explorer. We got in Louis's boat, and went pounding across Ray Strait. <clears throat> it's 14 miles wide. Of course, I remember sitting there, and I, I said to Louis, uh, I don't know, shouldn't we be wearing life jackets or something? And he looked at me, and he said, well, you know, <laughs> you go in this water, it's not going to matter if you have a life jacket on. <laughs> So this was, um, okay, this is on King William Island. Uh, you, I, and you see, people talk about how narrow Ray Strait is. And in the context, yes, it is narrow, but it's 14 miles across. Okay, that is narrow. It doesn't mean the ships are, you know, banging and backing up like in, in a parking lot. There's plenty of room for a ship to get through here. Um, and we, we camped out. <clears throat> And then, so, then we went and we eventually found the cairn. Here's a shot of Louis at the cairn in 1999, when we went there the first time. And I got back there just last summer. This is pretty fantastic. It was a great, great thrill to get back to the cairn because, uh, <clears throat> well, in 1999, we put this plaque there. We took turns carrying this plaque from our campsite to the spot where we found the cairn eventually, the remains of the cairn, and then we you know, put the plaque there, but 13 years later, I didn't know if the plaque was still gonna be there. I mean, this is out, <laughs> anything could happen. It could get blown over, a bear might knock it over, it doesn't seem likely, or, or some, some evil doer might come and take it away, which is a terrible thought. <clears throat> So, in 2012, when I was sailing with Adventure Canada as a lecturer, that's something my friend Ted has also done, uh, here's me with the captain talking about, here's the ship we're in, and you see the ship and the Zodiacs, that's how you, you get off the ship on the Zodiac and you go ashore just about anywhere. Now, I was concerned, though, <clears throat> because we had a hard time initially when we went to the Cairn for the first time, we went too far inland, and then we had to cross this uh, inlet and walk around it. I was concerned. I didn't know if we could get the ship close enough coming down this other way. So I talked to, we, we, we called in at a couple of places. I talked to a, a couple of different Inuit hunters and they, they looked at it. They said, should be no problem. You should be able to go right in there. Uh, and uh, sure enough, we managed to uh, get, and, and th there's the plaque, it's still intact. There's Sheena and me at the plaque. Here's, um, so, so every, there always has to be a, a one or two gun bearers around because there are polar bears that might come over the hill any time. Uh, we had Inuit throat singers. We had another Inuit woman who, uh, I, I, I think I'm safe in saying this is the 
only handstand that has ever been done at, at the John Ray Cairn. <clears throat> and the, so this is, the, this is the bunch I brought back in 2012. You see, I wanted to, to establish this as a viable destination. I'd like to see it, you know, this is some place, people, Canadians have this, we're going to search for the Franklin ships and celebrate this disastrous expedition. And I take the point, look, why don't we celebrate this victorious discovery by John Ray at this spot? And look, here's proof that it's not that hard to get there. So that's, that's the line I'm taking. Um, John Ray, forgotten explorer. Well, he, the one place he hasn't been forgotten is in Orkney. <clears throat> this is in St. Magnus Cathedral. This is the Mem Ray Memorial inside the cathedral, beautiful marble memorial. And there's another statue now being built in Orkney, now being uh, carved in Orkney, uh, that will be established. There's a, a conference coming up, <clears throat> a great celebration of John Ray, the 200th uh, anniversary of his of his birth in September. And I'll be there, and Ted will be there, and Margaret will be there, it's a family meeting. No, it's gonna be quite a big uh, event, unveiling this new statue in Stromness of John Ray. They haven't forgotten John Ray in Orkney. And that's basically, uh, that's basically all I've got to say. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's, it's a staggering story. I th there's something really peculiar about these explorers. Uh, so determined and uh, stand, uh, doing handstands uh, in the northern <laughs> Arctic. Well, now's your opportunity to ask Ken about the background and any other historical issues. Yes, um, up there on the left. Thank you. Hello. Um, could you tell us a bit more about the relics that were found and the conclusions that were drawn from them by Ray? Yes. Um, indeed, these relics were the ones that convinced even Lady Franklin that her husband was dead. Um, and <clears throat> there were uh, uh, various um, uh, spoons and uh, uh, more, more cap bands. And um, there was at least one spoon with the Sir John Franklin's um, and uh, crest on it. And there was the one I showed you there that said Hickey on it, who was one of his seamen. Th there was a multitude of stuff that he brought back. Um, I think uh, uh, some of it may be on, may be on display this uh, September in Orkney, but <clears throat> as, soon as, any, as soon as the experts saw it, including Lady Franklin, Lady Franklin had been in denial uh, refusing to believe that Franklin was dead, even though by now we're 1854. This is nine years after he sailed. But when Ray brought home those uh, relics, uh, even she had to admit it they were convincing enough. And I've got more detail in, in the book. Right. Yes, in the middle of the front row. I wondered, I was asking if it was true that in one of the longest walks that Sir John Franklin ever made, if not the longest. When he got to the end, he had trouble getting his foot out of his boot, and in the, his leg came out, leaving the foot behind in the boot. Is that wrong? No, that's not true. <laughs> right. There's another question. <clears throat> Um, I'm intrigued about the evidence to, uh, that exercises uh, Jane so much, you know, the evidence that, in fact, cannibalism had taken place. What, what, what was the hard evidence for that? It clearly was a, a Well, it's all been... Uh, uh, that was very much the issue at the time. Yeah. Okay. In contemporary times, it's, it, it has all been forensically established uh, by a couple of scientists named uh, Keenly Side, and the, the other one uh, eludes me at the moment. <clears throat> But the hard evidence, the hard evidence, and this, this, was, this was where Ray was open to attack, um, was uh, the testimony of the Inuit. So people, people who didn't want to believe 
uh, chose not to believe and chose to say that the Inuit were liars. And there's some terrible racist uh, material that uh, Dickens wrote, as a matter of fact. It's really quite, quite shocking. And the details, again, are in Fatal Passage. <clears throat> and, uh, and I recently wrote an introduction to um, a book called The Arctic Journals of John Ray, uh, in which I, I incorp incorporated his, his 1847 report. And Dickens, Dickens wrote two great long screeds in an attempt to repudiate Ray. And it did come down to an issue of how you were going to respect the Inuit. You see, Ray, <clears throat> Ray sat in that, in that tent and with the best interpreter in the Arctic, went over and over the story from the various different people who had actually been to the site. And they said, this is what it, this is what it looked like. This is what we saw. And the detail was so overwhelming. And it was corroborated not long afterwards by Charles Francis Hall, who uh, another explorer who went north. <clears throat> And uh, he lived up in the Arctic, and he went and met some of the Inuit as well. And, and of course, soon enough, I mean, even before Hall, Leopold McClintock went to the spot where Ray sent him. Now, McClintock went and he saw, he saw what he saw. But McClintock was sent by Lady Franklin, and he didn't publish. He didn't say, here's what I saw. He reported, well, here's what I saw, <laughs> if you see what I mean. <clears throat> Thank you. Yes, um, a question first of all in the middle there, and then we'll come back down to the front. I think that in the National Library of Scotland, in the Murray Archive, is Sir John Franklin's diary that was, has been um, restored with a lot of different sort of um, modern techniques for... Um, taking these very faint pencil marks and mm -hmm. so forth. I'm pretty sure it's there. Um, when, you, when you walk, as you must have done, in, to Waterloo Place in London and see that statue that Lady Franklin had put up of Sir John Franklin, you know, the man who ate his boots, um, and the plaque is there with the names of all the men and it says, the man who, the discoverer of the Northwest pas Passage, do you feel that actually it needs another little plaque at the bottom saying, well, not quite. <laughs> well, absolutely. In fact, <clears throat> I remember the moment when I, I walked to that, uh, to that statue in Waterloo Place. And this is, this, uh, you may have seen the movie Passage, which is based on my book, Fatal Passage. And there's an Inuit who, uh, an Enoch who goes to that spot. But he was actually following where I had gone. And I, I looked at that, and I was just slapping my forehead. <clears throat> it was, yeah, I, so I feel, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to lay my cards on the table. I mean, I think it should be John Ray, who's in uh, Westminster Abbey as well. You know, that was the other thing. Okay, but few people have had a figure like Lady Franklin behind them. She was extraordinary. She was the spin doctor of all spin doctors, and she was a statue maker. Anyway, okay, just briefly, Westminster Abbey, what happened there? <clears throat> she, oh, first of all, okay, you know the Nelson Monument in Trafalgar Square? She said, well, you know, Franklin died, and we should have something right adjacent to the Nelson Monument in Trafalgar Square. Well, that wasn't going to happen. So she went to Westminster Abbey. We should have a statue of Sir John in, in Westminster Abbey. The, the dean is scratching his head. He's not sure about that. <clears throat> she was influential. She had influential friends. And he, the dean says, okay, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll do a window. We'll do a window. No, no, I want a bust. Okay, okay, we'll do a bust. Okay, then her idea of a bust, though, this is good. First of all, she gets another sculpture to build this canopy over it. To build, it's like and then put a big stand under it. So if you go in there, it's very easily found. It's almost, you know, <laughs> right, right in off the door. And it stands taller than a man. It's a great big, huge statue, in effect. You know, he signed off on a bust. Well, this was some kind of bust, let me tell you. <laughs> so that was the kind of... And, she, and she, she's got statues in Spilsby in the town and, and another one down in Hobart. Uh, it's, a, it's a great tale. I mean, there's a wonderful statue of Franklin in Hobart 
and it's in a fountain, and the water's rushing over it. It's really quite nice, but, I mean, it's just pure and utter fabrication and fantasy. Ken, can you, uh, for those of us who don't know the story so well, um, can you take us back through what the, uh, how, draw a picture of the, of the end of the Franklin ship? And yes. Where, where was it? Yes, uh, well, the, 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 there were two ships, and they got trapped in the ice, um, off King William Island there, where I showed you. Yep. <clears throat> and uh, people are still arguing about this, <laughs> so about what happened. But basically, um, one of those ships uh, probably went down first. And th they're running out of food. And they're also getting delirious. And, and, and some men have been dying. Okay, they've been dying in unusually large numbers. And so basically, in a nutshell, if I'll just skip over any of the intricacies, <clears throat> they, leave, they abandon the ship, and they start for land, overland, to see if they can find help. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the majority of them appear to have gone straight south, down, King, down the coast of King William Island. Mm -hmm. um, and um, they started, uh, well, they were, they were hauling... Some of them were hauling a ship filled with plates and everything else, mm -hmm. all kinds of weird paraphernalia. Mm -hmm. And then they turned around and started hauling it back the other way. When McClintock found it in 1859, it was going back the other way. Anyway, they started dropping dead, down dead, and, <clears throat> and down, the, down towards the bottom, you got a few survivors. Um, there were pots uh, found with body parts in them, yeah. and uh, you asked for this. <laughs> and, and, and then the final survivor was found with his uh, rifle under him. So I think that was Crozier, and I think he killed himself at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, if all your fellows are down and you're, you're in the middle of the Arctic all by yourself. So it's quite a sad and tragic tale. Yeah. And what was, how long were they trapped there? Was it a, a long, long time? Well, again, they were, they were, they sailed in there, it was uh, 1840. The first winter, they, they wintered over in Beachy Island, oh, wow. <clears throat> which is kind of in that North Channel I showed you there. And there's, that's where the three graves were found. Yeah. Okay, three men died there, which is not unusual, and they right. buried them with all due honors. Right. And then they sailed south. Right. They sailed south down Peel Sound, right. and that's when they got trapped in the ice, because it opened up, and, and then they got trapped. So now we're into 18, <clears throat> 1846, 47. So then they abandoned ship. I, I forget off the top of my head. I think it was 1849 and started down. And some people have said, you know, there's evidence that in 1851 there were some people still alive. But th this is where you enter into the realm of yeah. speculation. But it's not surprising then that these people became mentally unstable. I mean, they were in, un, un, under incredible stress. Well, there were also, there's also a suggestion that that's true. There are also suggestions of two leading theories, the lead poisoning and botulism. Right. Botulism out of the food because of the way yeah. it was being processed. There's a whole book called Ice Blink that right. you know, elaborates that theory. And then the main emerging theory now, <clears throat> still to be published, is the theory of the, of the of the water faucet on the ship um, being so soldered with lead that that is the only explanation that'll account for the extreme lead levels that have been found? There's one body in in, in uh, down near London uh, that has been exhumed and is there are forensic studies and were done on it. I apologize for. It. Uh, digging out all this forensic information. But what's the next question, please? Uh, yes, in the front. Tell me, please, what uh, sort of shipping traffic uses the streets now? Yeah, it's growing all the time because the, um, the Northwest Passage is, is, is opening up. It's fascinating. For someone like me, my, my head is in the 19th century. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to confess that. But I have a vision of the Arctic from the 19th century that I built up from all this reading. Yeah. And what, I go to a place, and explorers have been writing about these piles of ice. 
and I get there in the same month, and there's no ice whatsoever. So I'm not a scientist, and I'm not making any claims, uh, but I can tell you that the Arctic looks very different today than it did. And, you know, I've read, as probably you have, um, how each year there's more and more open water, less and less ice, yeah. and there's an effect whereby the less ice you have, uh, the uh, less uh, reflection you have, and so it just, uh, there's a cumulative effect, and the ice is shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. So what, what ships are going through there now? Well, now there's a, a quite a few uh, ships like the one I've sailed through there uh, quite a few times, uh, 100 passengers um, of people who are interested in the Arctic and want to go and uh, explore it to some extent. But last year, there was a big ship, big ship, you know, 3,000 passengers able to get through there. And that's okay. The real scare is uh, these oil tankers. Um, yeah, you can run those things through there, uh, no problem, except maybe there is a problem. And if you get, you know, you get something happening like the Gulf of Mexico, you get an oil spill in the Arctic. That is, that is, uh, the mind boggles to think of it. So the Canadian government is trying to, you know, tighten its regulations and saying, okay, we want to control what, what kind of ships are going to be passing through here. Right, next question. Yes, then. Why did the remarkable... The Why did the remarkable Lady Franklin, for goodness sake, not send somebody to look for them? She had plenty of time. Oh, so she sent it. dozens of expeditions. I, I, I write about all that in my book, Lady Franklin's Revenge. She is an extraordinary... She... I, I, and the, the, where I got that title... You see, she grew up in Victorian times, and in Victorian England, and it's a very male-oriented society. And where her, uh, uh, a woman of her abilities would have been, a man of her abilities would have gone to Cambridge or Oxford and gone on and had a glorious career. She wasn't allowed to go to Cambridge or Oxford. She had to work through men. And so she, uh, the way she took her revenge in effect was she took control of Arctic exploration. She was driving the Royal Navy guys crazy. Um, <laughs> and she, she, she uh, sent ships out on her own, those she could afford. She raised subscriptions. She got people to subscribe and sent ships out. And she dunned the Royal Navy into sending ships out, expedition after. Some of those expeditions, they, they would go out with uh, a dozen ships, the big ones. Uh, the Belcher expedition, well, it, it was supposed to be the, the last great Arctic uh, expedition. And he went, you know, sailing home with his tail between his legs. It got a little cold out there. That was a bit more than he was ready for. But, <laughs> yeah, Lady Franklin commandeered Arctic exploration. She took it over and, uh, and sent out an expedition. In fact, early on, she was uh, communicating with John Ray. She was write, writing him letters and saying, well, we expect that you're going to be the one who's really going to be able to, uh, to solve this. Well, he was the one. Unfortunately, he didn't solve it to her satisfaction. Right. Any other questions? Yes, in the center there. John Ray must have had a life after Franklin. Can you just give us a thumbnail yeah. sketch of what happened there? Yeah, John Ray was extremely resilient. Well, you can tell I, am, I, I, I admire this man. Um, and he, uh, he, he had a, a, a couple of brothers in uh, Hamilton, uh, Ontario, or what's now Ontario in Canada. And um, he took the award. He, he did get, get an award for, for discovering the fate of Franklin. The Royal Navy recognized that. It was the, the great public. Uh, man, they managed to stop that. But he, he, did, he did get some money for that. And he built a ship. He built a ship. He intended to go and sail through Ray Strait. He, he built a ship that was going to go up there, and he was going to not only discover it, he was going to prove it. And the ship was built too late in the season, 
So he let it out for shipping on the Great Lakes in Canada. And those can be pretty wild too. And unfortunately, that ship sank. So that was, that was he, he, he let the Arctic dream go. He married a, a Canadian woman. Um, he didn't stop exploring. He, 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 he didn't go back to the Arctic, but he led an expedition through the, the Rocky Mountains um, from Fort Garry uh, westward uh, through the Rockies. And um, he uh, was up in Iceland rambling around. He was also, don't forget, very scientific minded. So he moved here to London and he was deeply involved with uh, writing scientific papers. And uh, he, he wrote a fair bit about the Inuit. He wrote a lot about the ice. He was involved in the scientific societies uh, of the day, and he, he, was, he published papers, and he was engaged, and um, he would also uh, be consulted and offer his advice. He said, you know, George Nair's ship shouldn't go up there. It's going to get stuck in the ice, and sure enough, we, they didn't listen. They wouldn't listen. They sent the ship up, and it got stuck in the ice. <laughs> so, you know, but yeah, Ray was actively engaged. He had a rich, long life, very happy marriage, and uh, when he died in, in London, um, he, uh, his wife, knowing his love of Orkney, brought him home to Orkney. And St. Magnus Cathedral, where that memorial is, he's buried in a small graveyard immediately behind it with a white cross, just very simply. Right. I'm, let me take two or three more questions, and then we'll let Ken uh, go. Yes. <coughs> Um, what, what was Lady Franklin's um, uh, influence on the lack of further British uh, Navy expeditions to the to, to the Northwest Passage? Well, it, it may just be that she stopped <laughs> she's hammering on the door. But there were other events that the Crimean War uh, came in. The Royal the, the Royal Navy had had just about enough of searching for Franklin. And uh, he was dead, and uh, okay, QED, and we have other business to conduct besides, you know, <laughs> listening. And and she wasn't driving it anymore because she admitted to, that he was dead as well. So she sent out McClintock in 1859. That was the last major expedition that was hands-on for her, <clears throat> and um, he basically affirmed. Uh, what Ray had reported without the um, uh, sensational uh, details. Which Ray, by the way, did not intend to publish publicly. He, he, he wrote a report. He had a responsibility. He was exploring for the Hudson's Absolutely, Bay Company. Yeah. He wrote a report, and he was exploring for the Admiralty, okay, saying, well, this is what happened. And he wrote another report for the Times, saying, well, you know, things ended badly. Uh, but he didn't include any details. But the Times then, well, I know as a journalist, an ex-journalist, you know, you just grab that story. And the more sensational, the better. And away you go. And um, uh, so, boom, there on the front page, uh, there it was, the, the whole uh, unsavory truth of the matter. Oh, wow. Uh, one more question. No more questions? Well, could I um, then ask Ted Kind to come and propose a vote of thanks? <coughs> and what that, to um, just say again that Margaret Street has played a hugely important role in ensuring that these stories are told and recounted and has given great support to those who are interested in this period. So thanks again, Margaret. Bye. Thank you, Sir John. Ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, been treated tonight to um, a very excellent lecture, I think, and I'm, I'm really relieved that it's done by a Canadian. It's, it's good to have somebody from away sing the praises of one of our own, rather than us singing them ourselves. Ken, um, <laughs> Ken and I have known one another for a bit now, um, and I was thinking, to, as he was listening to you, you know, John Ray once walked 40 miles from Hamilton to Toronto to deliver a lecture at the Canadian Institute. He walked. Um, you've come a wee bit further than that, actually, to, uh, to give your uh, lecture at this institute. I have to admit I'm an admirer of your output, Mr. McGugan. Um, 
I think that your books are convincing. I think that, as Sir John said, there's something a wee bit crazy about Arctic explorers, and I think you've shown tonight there's something just slightly a wee bit crazy about <laughs> people who write about them as well. But that's where you come across with your fantastic enthusiasm um, for this subject, which I share, but I have to say I come from Dumfries, and I'm a Richardson man. John Richardson, e, uh, John Ray, John Ross, James Clark Ross. To be a successful Arctic explorer in the 19th century, you had to have a surname that began with R. <laughs> um, and John Richardson was the one person who actually knew that he had consumed human flesh by mistake. And he reported that to the Navy, and they hushed it up. If they'd done the same with John Ray, there would not be quite the same story to tell today. I think you would, would agree. Now, <laughs> I was interested in reading your books to find that you lambasted Lady Franklin in Fatal Passage, and then it seems to me you fall in love with her in Lady Franklin's Revenge, and admit that you're, you're quite an admirer. And you also wrote this book, which nobody here would dare write, called How the Scots Invented Canada. <laughs> And I'm not sure that they did, but it's good fun anyway, you know? <laughs> and it, 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 it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful to hear. Um, I don't think we recognize, ladies and gentlemen, here the extent to which the Canadians are absolutely obsessed with Franklin. For some reason, which has never quite been explained to me, the Franklin thing is a big marker in Canadian history, in Canadian perceptions of themselves. Perhaps it's because of Franklin, that the Canadians first take possession of the Arctic, or for the first time, re recognise the Arctic as part of Canada. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind, of course, is that John Ray's becoming, thanks to Ken, one of the best known of all the Arctic explorers, or Scottish ones anyway, through his book and through the film that followed. Um, but he himself has acknowledged Richard's biography of John Ray, and the <coughs> book from the National Museum of Scotland, 1993, by Ian Bunyan, Jenny Cauldron, Dale Edens, and Bryce Wilson, No Ordinary Man, which again I think was a kind of breakthrough book myself, um, which you have greatly elaborated on, greatly um, interested people in. It's a very dangerous thing in this room to talk about the virtue of knighthoods, because we do have one or two of them in the Royal Society, we're pleased to say. Um, there are sometimes people who acquire knighthoods who don't deserve them. And two of these were definitely, in my view, McClure and Collinson, who were two really nasty pieces of work who did not deserve any kind of accolade at all, in, in my opinion. But I think you're right, Ken, that uh, if somebody did, it was John Ray. And I've got to thank you very much on behalf of us all for enlightening us further about this remarkable man. Thank you.